So welcome everyone to o Textile Talks. And it looks like we still have a few people um, entering the room. So we'll have a little patience here. And as we begin, um, but I wanna say welcome. My name is Meryl Como. I'm a mixed media artist and a member of the events committee of the Surface Design Association, a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. I can see that some of you are typing in where you are logging in from and introducing yourself and I encourage you to do that so we can see where you where you're all logging in from. So I'm delighted to welcome you to the, this week's textile talk crafting the vote. Textile talks webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. I'll start with a few housekeeping announcements. We welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of all of the artist presentations. Please submit them in the Q and A box at, located at the bottom of your screen. We're honored to bring you this free and inspirational textile talk programming. We respectfully ask that you are courteous as you engage with speakers and moderators and participants. And remember that the chat is available to be seen by everyone. So use the Q&A for your questions and the chat box for greeting each other and survey or commentary on what's on our programming and ways that we can improve. And if, if you're one of those people who prefers not to see the chat, you can toggle the chat on and off by, by tapping on the chat button. Oh, I see we still have people entering, so I'm gonna give it another minute. Thank you for your patience as we make sure that everyone has entered the room. So I'm Meryl, I'll be your moderator. I think I jumped the gun a little bit there because I can see that more people are entering the room. So have a little patience and I will probably reiterate my introduction. I love seeing everyone typing in their name and saying where they are logging in from, people from all over the country. Mm 
All right, it looks like we hopefully we're all in the room. So I apologize to those of you for whom this is a repeat, but I'm going to say welcome. And I'm Meryl Como. I'm a mixed media artist and member of the events committee of the Surface Design Association, which is a nonprofit uh, membership organization focused on contemporary fiber art and textile art. I'm delighted to welcome everyone into this week's uh, textile talk, which is called Crafting the Vote. Textile Talks webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and the Surface Design Association. And I'm going to review again a few housekeeping announcements. We welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of the artist presentations. All the presentations will happen first, then we'll think about questions. So please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. It's important to use the Q&A box. We're honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming, and we respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and participants. And, and your chat comments, do remember your chat comments can be seen by everyone. So please use the Q&A for your questions and the chat box for greeting others, for logging in, telling us where you're logging in from, and for commentary on ways we can improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button and it will toggle them on or off. So today's textile talk, Crafting the Vote, presents three different approaches to thinking about voting, elections, and the legislative process. Our first, let's see, all three of our presenters are SDA members, it looks like, and SOCWA members, and um, their social media links will be in the chat as well as some information from the SDA about an upcoming opportunity. So our first presenter is Eve Jakes Jacobs Carnahan, and Eve creates democracy-themed knitted sculptures to illuminate abstract issues affecting society. Her public art project, Knit Democracy Together, holds knitting circles that demystify the electoral process for sharing rules affecting access to voting, the electoral college, gerrymandering, and other issues imp impacting our representational democracy. Our second, our next presenter will be Tomasita Louvier Legon. Tomasita is a co-curator for Access Delayed, African American Suffragists' Courageous Influence on the 19th Amendment, a collection of quilts from the Quilt Friends Collective, which is intended to educate and celebrate some of the African American suffragists who influenced efforts to gain the right to vote for all women with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And our third and last presenter will be Anne Morton. Anne offers a visual review of the Violet Protest, a nationwide public art project that employed handmade textiles as tools for protest against political divisiveness. The project focused on values that we hold dear rather than specific political or social issues. And by its completion, approximately 13,500 squares were made by over 2,000 makers and all were sent so to each member of the 117th Congress of the United States. This promises to be very interesting presentations. So Eve, you are up first, and would you like to turn on your video and share your presentation? Yes, thank you. Getting my screen set up here. There, thank you, Meryl. I'm glad to be here today. My journey to making democracy-themed art started with birds. So I'm going to take you back about six years to 2016. And at that time, my knitted sculpture addressed environmental issues. I placed birds in compromised habitats like this one called trawling the algae overload. The pelican with its empty beak is searching in vain for fish in dead black choke, water choked with algae. I wanted to do more than make beautiful objects. As I explored ways that humans impact nature, I communicated messages. The name of this piece is Shrill Call. In this work called Encroachment, 
I used cast off pieces of plumbing parts to represent the water systems that come with commercial land development. It was around the time I created this piece that I made a big change in my life. Up until then, I split my time between work as a lawyer and work in my art studio. In 2018, I became a full-time artist. About a year later, I went to an environmental summit of scientists and artists, and it seemed like a natural fit for me based on the artwork I was making at the time. The conference focused on visual storytelling and using art to engage the community in environmental actions. But sitting there listening to people talk with deep knowledge about rivers, pollutions, and wetlands made me realize I was actually a little bit out of my depth. My experience was not in science, it was in law, particularly election law. The conference was really exciting though. I learned how artists were educating people. And so I thought I'm going to find a way to apply this to something I know about. So I started to figure out how to address abstract ideas in artwork that would have to do with elections. I looked at birds again, and I asked, could the birds be used to illustrate concepts in democracy? I sketched illustrations of vignettes about democracy and elections, and I researched birds so that I could cast them in appropriate roles in these stories. One sketch I made was of an owl preying on smaller birds controlling their activities. It could play the role of a powerful campaign donor, influencing weak legislators who seek to please the donor in order to raise money for their election campaigns. So the great horned owl seemed perfect. It eats small birds and it hunts at night. He would be the powerful figure at the top of the sculpture. I made his face from logos of corporations that are among the largest campaign donors to political campaigns. You might see on the tips of the feathers of the owl's wings are pieces of a dollar bill. For the legislators who were overpowered by the owl, I chose pigeons. They seemed just right because pigeons live on windowsills and under the eaves of buildings. They don't clean their nests and pigeons were used by the military to send warning messages in World War I. So into the lower pigeon's nest, I placed pieces of the cut up dollar bill from the owl's feathers. And then I gave the flying pigeon a leather backpack to carry a warning message. Here's the final sculpture. It's called At the Expense of Democracy. The next sculpture in this democracy theme that I developed was going to represent gerrymandering. And so I worked on the idea of creating several birds and some smaller creatures, and I would arrange them in districts that were gerrymandered shaped districts. So this started with two birds in wetland habitats. I was making a series of birds, so I decided to have certain elements be the same on each one. The head and beak of each is covered with blue mulberry paper. For the breast of each bird, I wet felted natural brown wool and I added white stripes with needle felting. And I thought the story of gerrymandering would not be complete without salamanders. So there you see the famous political cartoon from an 1812 Boston newspaper. It depicts a district on Boston's North Shore whose shape resembled a salamander-like monster. Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry approved this map and his political rival newspaper dubbed it a gerrymander. So these are the clay salamanders that I made to live in the districts with the green herons. I made six herons and nine salamanders. That paper diagram shows how I grouped them into five districts with three creatures in each district. The pistachios are the herons, and the smaller black beans, the salamanders. Even though they are outnumbered by the salamanders, the herons have a majority control in three of the five districts. This photo shows one district in the, the installation where there are two green herons and one salamander. You might not quite see the salamander here though because it's caught in the beak of that upper bird. To reinforce the lesson about gerrymandering, I incorporated real maps of congressional districts on the faces of the printed pedestal cubes, uh, cube pedestals. This one shows Ohio's congressional district map along with two selected districts with their really weird shapes. 
This is my favorite bird in the installation. And here is a view of several of the districts in the installation. It's called gerrymandering the marsh. And here's the full installation. That 2019 environmental conference sparked my interest in combining art with activism in another way. I developed an idea for a social action art project about elections. I decided that I wanted it to include a collaborative sculpture, gatherings of people in knitting circles, and an educational component about democracy. In 2020, I began holding circles originally planned in person, but they turned out to be Zoom circles and I held them in collaboration with cultural organizations. The participants in these circles mailed me swatches like these shown here that they made in the circles. Using the swatches from the knitting circles, I built a sculpture of a state capital. It is a metaphor for representative democracy. The different colors and textures of the swatches symbolize the diversity of people in our community. A truly representative government allows input for all people and enacts laws that serve the broad public interest. Here is the completed state capital sculpture. It is five feet wide, three and a half feet tall, and nearly three feet deep. There's lots of symbolism here. The gloved hands holding knitting needles represent the idea that democracy is an ongoing process. The second component of the project are the knitting circles themselves. I wanted to engage people with each other and with the issues. For me, real participation in this project goes beyond making a swatch for the sculpture. This is a view of the knitted state capital on display at the Vermont State House. That's what we call our state capitals in New England. I invited the public to come together and stitch pieces of the lawn and gardens that people had made in the knitting circles. In this gathering, just like in the knitting circles, people who did not know each other came together because they share a love of yarn and knitting. So they entered the room already having something in common. The third element of my project is education. During the hour and a half knit democracy together circles, while participants knit a swatch for the sculpture, I give a presentation on current topics related to the electoral process. Drawing on my background as an election lawyer, I have addressed many issues. These have included voting by mail, how votes are counted, gerrymandering, ranked choice voting, and the financing of elections. After each circle, I share resources for people to learn more. I lead a discussion and I follow up with emails sharing insights into issues affecting the electoral process and suggest ways to take action. As I said, this started during the pandemic. So the first year and a half of circles had to be held on Zoom. This actually created opportunities for me to travel virtually to Chicago and to Rochester, New York. Here you can see the Illinois and New York State Capitol buildings created by participants in those circles. I'm planning to continue this project through 2024 and I'm continuing to seek guilds, art centers and cultural organizations where I can hold more knit democracy together circles. I want to inspire people to strengthen the democratic process, whether by responding to misinformation, supporting reforms to make our system more representative, or doing voter protection work. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Very interesting. All right, now, Tomasita, are you able to start your video and unmute and begin your presentation? So I am able to unmute um, Astrid. And Astrid will begin your slides. Let's give her a minute. How are you, Tomasita? I'm doing well. <laughs> Good. So I'm just going to say uh, thank you to all of our sponsors um, and thank you, Meryl, and thank you, Astrid, um, for uh, contacting me and uh, allowing me to participate. And um, this collection of 
asking me to start my video. This collection of quilts, um, it was planned to be um, displayed in person, but then COVID hit. I think COVID hit all of us and uh, it was launched virtually on the uh, uh, Texas Folklife uh, Museum's uh, website. And I think the Smithsonian's uh, educational site. But this presentation is um, Access Delayed and it's the African-American suffragettes um, courageous influence on the 19th Amendment. And how this came about was a friend of mine, uh, co-curator um, Sharon Mooney, and I uh, learned of the, you know, some quilt collections that were coming up. And we wondered, um, you know, about the um, portrayal of the African-American suffragettes who we knew just through uh, historical um, activities were left out. And so this collection of quilts is a um, participation of our friends who could probably, you know, in my mind, could stand me. I'm a professional project manager, you know, just organizing them along until we got this uh, completed. So uh, next slide. So as um, immediately after the Civil War, um, you know, there were opportunities to change the laws, to recognize um, the previously enslaved uh, Americans as uh, citizens. And so um, Sharon uh, Mooney, this quote is called The Laws, its um, maker is Sharon Mooney, um, began her research in, you know, really trying to find out what laws were in place and, you know, what was really going on with the inability of women and African Americans and um, not to be able to vote. And so in her research, um, basically she did the research to find out all the laws and opportunities for us to get this right beginning with um, ratification of the 14th and 15th amendments, and then all the way to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965. So she has laid uh, all of this out here um, for, in the quilt for us to really get um, an in-depth idea of the laws that were actually in place to provide the, the right to vote, but was delayed. Astrid, next slide, please. So again, we uh, had a list of all the suffra suffragettes, African-American suffragettes that we wanted to portray. And uh, Sharon Mooney chose Isabella Bomfrey, who we know as uh, Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth um, represents the earliest um, African-American woman who was uh, anti-slavery and women's right advocate. And her uh, now famous Ain't I a Woman speech was delivered in 1851 uh, at the Women's Right Convention in Akron, Ohio. Next, please. Mary Ann Shad Cat, uh, Cat Carrie is uh, also another uh, suffragette that uh, started early um, in the uh, women's rights uh, movement. And this quilt was made by uh, Deborah Harris. And she um, shows um, that Mary Ann Shad Car Carey was a women's rights advocate. She was also an attorney, an educator, and an anti-slavery uh, activist whose parents were freed Americans, but with the um, anti slavery anti-fugitive laws that were coming into place, her parents immigrated to uh, Canada. And her saying was to, it's better to uh, rust out um, rather than, it's better to wear out than to rust. Out. 
as the African American uh, women um, began to uh, participate in suffrage activities, um, they really faced um, threats to their well being on uh, several layers. And so our uh, quilt maker here, Lauren Aaron, Arrington Savage, um, wanted to depict the uh, threats that uh, were faced by the women. And this quilt is called the Naysayers. So this quilt portrays not only the opposition uh, that was received to all the women uh, suffragettes, but also uh, there is the period where uh, the white women uh, did not want the African-American women to vote. And then also uh, their family members, um, the threat from, you know, just people knowing that you were participating in, some, in something that could bring harm or danger to your family. So again, um, there was a lot of participation in suffrage activities, but it wasn't an easy one. Anna J. Cooper, this quilt uh, is also made by Lauren Arrington Savage. And Anna J. Cooper um, was a highly educated uh, African-American woman. She's also um, an author and she was a public speaker nationally and internationally. So she was uh, highly sought after for uh, the women's suffrage movement that happened in uh, Europe but you know, found different responses here in the US. Um, Anna J. Cooper um, advocated for uh, education and equality. And Anna J. Cooper is one of 13 Americans and the only woman who has a quote on the US passport. They marched yesterday. I will vote today. So this quilt is made by Cynthia Vaughn. And um, this quilt by Cynthia is a tribute to the African-American suffragists and organizers and the marches uh, that were organized to um, and their sacrifices to gain equality. If you had an opportunity and hopefully you can see some of this, um, she has pictures of African-American women who were heavy participators uh, in the suffrage movement, but there's that invisibility of uh, their activities. Ida B. Wells, for the record, this uh, quote was made by me, and uh, there's a lot of symbolism in here. Um, Ida B. Wells, is a figure that um, I think more people know if they saw her face. And I wanted to uh, pick uh, women, one that was more well-known and one that was less known. And so Ida B. Wells is that, represents that woman to me. She was an anti-lynching advocate and the red bars to the right of the quilt represent uh, the lynching um, that she uh, wrote her articles about. She was also an advocate for um, women's suffrage, of course, and she was the founder of multiple uh, women's club in the Chicago area. Um, Ida B. Wells participated in the 1913 uh, Women's March in Washington, D.C., and uh, she was asked by Alice Paul to um, march in the back of the parade because the Southern suffragists um, would not lend their support if they had to march together with um, all of the suffragists. And so uh, Ida Wells um, declined the, um, that invitation. And when her uh, delegation from Illinois passed through uh, in the parade, she joined in the parade with them uh, there. Mary Church Terrell, 
not so silent suffrage, uh, not so silent sentinel. Uh, Mary Church Terrell is um, an African American woman who I feel is uh, less known, um, but also had a very important impact upon uh, women's suffrage um, as she was able to participate in um, white suffrage uh, organizations with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton Cady. Um, she was also part of Alice Paul's uh, Silent Sentinels who um, picketed the uh, Wilson uh, White House administration um, uh, as an activist for uh, women's right to vote. And if I can go back one, one on both of these, uh, when I was doing the research, I was very um, taken with the quotes that were said because even though they were said almost a hundred years ago by these women, they were uh, still very relevant today. Okay, Astrid, thank you. Texas Queens. This quilt is um, made by Laura Casmore and it's a tribute to her mother and her grandmother um, who participated in organizing their communities in uh, Texas. Um, just like, you know, women's clubs were organized as a way to help the community learn one, the importance of getting out the vote, getting out there, participating in voting, but what the importance was to the to the community. And so women's clubs were organized all over the country, but uh, particularly uh, Laura wanted to share the clubs that were organized uh, in Texas. Fearless, um, this quilt was made by uh, author Barbara Brown Gathers and um, our, uh, Barbara wanted to portray the connection to uh, Maggie Lena Walker, who was the first uh, woman, uh, African-American woman, who chartered a bank. And the name of that bank was called St. Luke's Penny Savings uh, Bank. And when going through her great-grandmother's things, they found that... Um, Maggie, Lena Walker, and uh, Barbara's grandmother um, were part of the same organi organization that uh, taught the importance of um, economic growth in the community um, along with the power of the vote. And so um, through her efforts of uh, working hard uh, she was able to um, purchase uh, land and uh, pass that wealth down to her family. Margaret Murray Washington. Um, this quote was made by Karen Robinson. Margaret uh, Murray Washington uh, is an organizer who is the wife of um, Booker T. Washington. And uh, in their um, quest to help their community, um, they sought to uh, educate and have the community participate in self-reliance activities and also have um, collaboration with uh, other groups, uh, interracial collaborations to uh, get um, things done in the community. And Margaret Murray Washington is um, quoted as the sole African-American woman uh, in Susan B. Anthony's book, The History of Women's Suffrage. Angela Davis, this uh, quote was um, made by Cynthia Vaughn. And um, we all know, I think, the negative parts to Dr. Angela Davis, but she was a political activist and organizer. And um, 
currently she is uh, working in prison reform in which we know um, in some of the felons when they get out of uh, the uh, prison system and uh, getting them uh, the ability to vote. Activist Fannie Lou Hamer, this uh, quote was made by Jennifer Steverson. And uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was an uh, equal rights activist and a community organizer uh, in Mississippi. And uh, Fannie Lou Hamer is known for her uh, speech given at the Democratic National Convention where she famously said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And uh, this was also <laughs> at a time that uh, the Democrats would not seat um, the African-American congregation into the uh, national convention. And so um, just the idea that she was able to be a speaker there uh, speaks volumes to me. But uh, Fannie Lou Hamer um, participated in uh, marches with um, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King as um, well as many of our uh, civil rights uh, leaders that we know today and um, was very instrumental in her activism, not only in Mississippi, but across our whole country. And good trouble, what can I say? <laughs> this quote was done by, uh, Ron, uh, made by Rhonda Masters and um, it portrays uh, Stacey Abrams, who we consider uh, a modern day suffragist. Um, she is an organizer for fair elections and the protection of the right, uh, the right to vote for all eligible uh, voters. And, you know, just the idea that, you know, we are still going through um, voter suppression and you know, issues around who can vote is, you know, pretty uh, amazing and outstanding to, to me, but um, we have to have the uh, right for everyone to participate in the vote um, continue. And uh, Stacey Abrams is uh, participating in that for us right now. So I want to thank you again, uh, Astrid and uh, SDA and all the sponsors of the Textile Talks and uh, SACWA. Um, again, this quilt collection was able to uh, make its um, visual in-person uh, in debut at the Houston Quilt Festival uh, last year with the uh, sponsor being eQuilter. And I'd like to thank our uh, quilt artists of the Quilt Friends Collective. Uh, without this um, collection of quilters, this presentation would not um, be um, important, presenta important presentation would not be um, available. The artist statements and the virtual displays can be viewed on the Texas Folklife site. And I have the link here um, you probably can't click on the uh, link, but I'm, I know it'll be shared. And if you want to contact me, um, here's my contact information uh, right here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tomasita. It's wonderful, rich, rich collection. And now, Anne, would you like to share your presentation? Sure, hello, everybody. Let me uh, get my presentation up here. I'm, thank you so much, whoops, Meryl, and I'm so honored to be here with Eve and Tomasita and to be able to share a little of the background story about the Violet Protest. Um, so the Violet Protest, which was launched in January of 2020, uh, rests on these core values. And the big idea, the nugget that really pulled this project together was the idea of red and blue, which we all know represent the two major ideologies in our country. But being a color teacher for years, I know that when you mix 
red and blue on the color wheel, you get violet. And I love that word because it's one letter away from the word violent. So our goal had always been to send bundles of handmade textiles to every member of the 117th Congress to demonstrate that if, if we as citizen makers are willing to come together, so can our elected officials. So thousands of makers, just over 2000 makers from all 50 states, uh, the DC and even Canada made eight by eight inch squares, equal parts for the most part of red and blue using a whole variety of fiber techniques and combination of techniques. We made enough squares to yield between 24 and 25 squares for every member of Congress. And that represented almost 60,000 hours of hand labor. We know as makers that we carry that American tradition of hands that craft ideas into both productive and aesthetic objects. And so it was through our hands that we made this colossal physical symbol of our collective desire for national unity. So people uh, that participated are very familiar with this graphic um, and you'll see that this graphic becomes real, but uh, it, what it was was our chart of progress to see how far we were getting. So each of these squares represents 230 squares. And as you can see, it's the letters US, which of course stands for the United States, but it also stands for us. The portal into the project was, uh, and still is, the project website. And so you could volunteer there, find out how to, uh, to sign up, look for news, um, resources. But one of the funnest pages to visit is a progress page. And that's where you'll find that US chart, that progress chart. There's a heat map of the United States, but there is a list of each and every one of those stacks um, of who contributed to that stack. And when I got their squares in, uh, a portion of those squares were photographs. So you can scroll through thousands of violet protest squares and see the amazing diversity in the maker's ideas. So another thing that helped me stay regular on social media was developing the Square of the Week program. So every week uh, I would select a square that spoke to the times because remember this project was launched in January of 2020. Only months later, we were hit by, by the worldwide pandemic. We witnessed a summer of racial unrest. We went through a historic election and it was capped off by an attack on our US Congress building. So all these squares became this amazing visual chronologic record of what we had all endured through those times. And so along the squares along with a, a message was posted on Instagram and Facebook throughout the project. So one silver lining about um, the pandemic, as we all know, was that we all learned about Zoom. And Zoom allowed me to visit nearly 40 groups all around the country and meet face to face this group here is the Virginia Sakwa Guild. And so it was really actually a, 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 a great silver lining. So once I uh, got notification that someone signed up, these packets went out to every maker. They had some instructions. It told you what stack you were in on that grid that I showed you. And you also got these violet colored tags that you would put your your name and your city and state. You could also put a little message on the back. And each of those tags was attached to each and every square that was made. So over the course of 20 months, I sent out about 30 to 34 packets every week. So we all were washing our groceries. We didn't know what was safe and wasn't safe. All of these packages were coming in right here in my home studio. And so uh, what I did was I quarantined packages for two weeks before I would open them. That was really difficult, I have to say. But I would date them as when they came in and then put a date on when to open them. 
So just before the exhibition uh, at the Phoenix Art Museum, we had a deadline of February 1st. And in that two week period around that deadline, I received over 2,600 squares. And you can see my bewildered little dog in the background there. This is only a fraction of what it looked like around here. So here we are at Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, these walls were 40 feet and 30 feet long by 12 feet high. And they were covered uh, top to bottom with violet protest squares. Um, and also local volunteers were the ones that sewed all these squares to uh, these fabric strips to allow us to hang them. So the deal was that um, all of these squares that are on the wall represent all the makers that got their work in by February 1st. And they were guaranteed that if they did that, they would get at least one square on the wall. And the remainder of the squares were stacked in the US stacks. And so there were about 2000 squares on the wall and about 7,500 squares in those stacks. And you can see here on the left, the texture and all those tags that are coming off the squares. Uh, people, I, I visited the museum twice a week um, and I saw people just spending hours looking through all these squares. So here is the US stacks made real. Uh, and this is at installation. Like I said, there are about 7,500 squares. By the end of the exhibition, uh, I added squares every week as they came in and the exhibition was six months long. So by the end, uh, we had over 13,000 squares on, uh, on exhibit. We had lots of special visitors, not to mention makers that traveled across the country and lo lots of local makers come and see the exhibition, but also Congressman Greg Stanton of Arizona has been a great supporter of the project. And he started by coming and meeting face to face with the squares on the wall. And the mayor of Phoenix, Kate Gallego proclaimed uh, April 13th, 2021 as Violet Protest Day in the city of Phoenix. And she was gracious enough to wear her violet colored coat when she visited the exhibition. So once the exhibition was over, we moved all those thousands of squares to this abandoned room, which was donated to us. It wasn't pretty, but boy, it, it was so useful. It was as big as a football field. And we had a table for each and every state. The squares were sorted by state. And you can see these boxes underneath each table. And those are for the representatives and senators from that state. So first, we put squares uh, from their own state in their box. And then Randomly, those squares uh, from all over the country were added to, to equal that 25 squares per box. And then makers um, spent about two, or I'm sorry, volunteers spent about two weeks listing the makers on this handwritten list, their name, their city, and zip code, so that each lawmaker got this list and could see exactly who had contributed the squares in their box. And the boxes were capped off with this brochure. There was also a letter from me and the project, but also makers were invited to write letters. So at least four letters from makers all over the country were included in these uh, brochures in the boxes. And so on November 15th, 2021, 540 boxes were sent to uh, Washington, DC. We had lots of themes going on with the squares. I'm gonna show you just only a few because I could be here all day showing you squares. They're all amazing. Lots of hands, lots of red and blue hands working together, coming together. Lots of animals, um, birds and mammals and all kinds of creatures were represented in the squares. Um, this one, uh, Valerie Titan Square, that was her own cat that modeled for that square. Lots of geometry going on. Of course, with uh, weaving, we know that that's a very uh, exacting process. Nancy Nowak was a magistrate judge that instead of a gold watch, she asked her colleagues for a floor loom for her retirement. And so she wrote me a whole story about 
her becoming a weaving a weaver after being a, a judge. And then this wonderful Stitch Square by Don Schwaim in um, Boyne City. And of course, as I said before, the squares really reflected the times. Nancy Nakamoto made this wonderful square that became just one of the touchstones of the project. It had an actual working mask on it. It was beautifully crafted. And then Angela Myers, she made her square out of PPE material. And the moment in time that Angela sent this along with her photograph, uh, as you hopefully you can see that, um, it was when we were panicked, we were short on PPE material. And so um, this square has a huge amount of uh, importance at that moment in time. And I just wanna share very briefly with you this note from Congresswoman Abigail Spamberger from Virginia. And she wrote this to one of the makers who had included a letter in her package um, and I'm just gonna read a portion of it to you. She says, I am grateful you and other makers are calling on my colleagues and me to firmly put country first and demonstrate the commitment and for some, the courage to work together, find common cause and focus fully on the good of the country. With gratitude, Abigail Spamberger. And so that concludes my presentation. Uh, you can take a look and, and learn so much more on the project website. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Ravelry. I'm, I think I'm soon to quit Twitter, I have to be honest. And the next step for the project is that we are uh, doing a fundraising for a documentary that will be presented by Arizona PBS and then distributed to the national PBS network that we're really excited about. So with that, I can stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all of you for your presentations. You can all come back in if you, if possible and uh, put, turn your videos on and we'll have a little chat. I wanna encourage everyone who's in the room to look in the chat actually for some links. There are links, um, uh, social media links and other information that uh, may answer some of your questions or uh, I encourage you to look further into all of our panelists. So as we begin our, um, our question and answers section, uh, we have a few minutes here. Um, all three of you are community artists. And it's clear from your presentations that all three of you are really true collaborators. Um, and so I would like to do this a little differently today and, um, and actually encourage you to have a conversation amongst the, the three of you. So I, I know I, I, I know we'll get we'll gain insights into your process as you sort of share you know, thoughts and resources. And Tomasita, I believe you have a question for Eve. So I'm wondering if you could start us off. So, uh, Eve, your presentation was awesome, and it just percolated ideas in my mind. And um, I guess I didn't know that an election lawyer is part of the process. And so I think a lot of education can go on with um, the process of the voting process from uh, the, the laws and the, you know, the, the volunteers that participate. And I was wondering if you would like to collaborate on a, a quilt a project that would uh, educate the public about the elections process. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great idea. Um, and you already, in essence, you were really doing a quilt project about the history of voting and you really are would be really asking how to just take that into the present day, I would think. And one of the things I found, which is so fun about my project, and I think probably Anne has had the same experience, is that um, people, I had no idea what people's reaction would be when they came to the project. And unlike your group, Thomasita, where I think you knew all of the people in the quilting group, I didn't know who would participate. And people, come to the knitting circles and bring their experiences and talk about what they're doing for volunteering and it leads to more conversations. And it's right. been very 
gratifying and taking new directions. So definitely we could talk about collaborating on a quilt project. <laughs> I think it would yeah. be great um, that, you know, the three of us could probably collaborate on something, even though um, Anne looks like you are uh, in for a very long <laughs> uh, project continuation with your documentary for uh, PBS. No. Well, um, you know, this this idea of bringing people in, uh, you know, a lot of us had a lot of difficulties during the pandemic. I have to say that I was blessed because imagine me getting all these squares in all throughout 2020 and 2021. It was just truly a gift. And so I really feel privileged that, that I was in the position to connect with these thousands of makers. I, I see some of their names on the chat here. So I recognize them. And it's, it's amazing how you can get to know people that you, you just didn't know before and um, make a connection. And I'm, Eve, I know you've expressed that. And um, unfortunately, we couldn't do any face-to-face -face, uh, workshops. We did a couple and then boom, you know, the pandemic hit, but thank goodness for Zoom. It was, it was really a gift actually. Exactly. Yeah. Our first yeah. time that we were able to interact with the public was uh, last year when the quilts were shown at the quilt festival. So I, I know what you mean that, um, you know, Zoom and technology um, really brought us all together, but it was really great to just be with people yeah. and answer questions in person. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, the, the me oh, go ahead, Meryl. No, go ahead, Anne. Finish your thought. Well, well, I was just going to say, um, we, 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 our exhibition was March through September 2021. And, you know, we went in and out of thinking, okay, we're, we're out of the danger zone. And then Delta hit. And then we, you know, we were back to masks again. And then, you know, Omicron hit. So, it, you know, it's, it's been a roller coaster. But I think, um, not that I would wish this on, on us all ever again, but all the things that we experience, not just the pandemic, but how it really unearthed uh, the social inequities in our society. Um, it really made this project and, and it seems like all of your projects so much more important than they would have been otherwise because we were all living it. Yes, that's very yeah. true. So I did capture a few questions from the from the audience that I will I'll try to go. We have about mm, two minutes, so maybe we will keep <laughs> our answers fairly brief. But um, some of the questions were well, one was for all three of you, and that is, have you thought about doing a children's book about your projects? Which I think is a great suggestion. And um, and then so that's you know a comment and a question. But um, in terms of some of the other things are. Um, how could people see the pieces that you have made? And so maybe you could um, take a minute as I'm saying our goodbyes and just put into the chat where people can see actually see in person the the um, the quilts and the pieces that are made. I I know um, I know Tomasita. I know the quilts are on the um, the Texas Folk Museum website and so forth. So maybe we could type that into the chat as we as we move out. Um, one of the question, other questions, um, Tomasita, was about the quote on the passport. Do you happen to know it offhand? The quote on the passport. Support. I don't have the quote and actually I was pretty surprised when I saw it but uh, yeah they went to the Texas Folk Life they could read all of the artist statements um, that go into depth about each uh, quilt and Anna J. Cooper's quilt and quote is uh, all on that uh, website. Excellent all right and then one of the other questions and was how did you fund your project? Uh, well, the, the initial funding came from a grant that was given uh, from the Phoenix Art Museum, but that that quickly evaporated. And so really the funding came from the makers themselves and people they knew and people that supported the project. So it truly was and still is supported by the people that are actually participating in the project. 
And Anne, while you're while you're talking, I'm wondering if maybe you could bring us into a, a closing moment by sharing a quote about your project that helps us continue this work with optimism. You know, we have heard today about Fannie Lou Hammer, who said, "I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired," and I certainly understand that view. And I, and we've also heard the the um, the quote um, about uh, from um, Marianne Shad Carey: "It's better to wear out than rust." <laughs> I love that one too. So, Anne, do you want to share a quote, a contemporary quote, quote from your project that sort of gives us the optimism and hope for the future? Sure. Well, um, or at least the impetus to keep going, right? Yes. Um, yeah. I I was just sharing when we met on this that that I've gotten so many notes and cards from makers, and here's one from Amy Bird from Tempe, Arizona, right here. We are a vivid and beautiful people. We are an unfinished and imperfect country. Our divisions are stark like a womb that needs stitches. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, um, I want to thank our presenters today in crafting the vote and textile talks. Um, and I wanna thank our audience for joining us today. And in particular, a big thank you goes out to Lucy Shaken and the SACWA organization for hosting us. So, um, and the, I also want you to know that the recording of this will be available on YouTube in the next week. And next Wednesday, Textile Talk hosts conversations with the artists Sustain Ability, which is sponsored by SACWA. So thank you to our sponsors as well, who I believe we're going to see listed soon.